Okay, so here's what I need. Did I say five volunteers? Yeah. yeah, so I need five volunteers, and you are going to be discussion leaders. So I need five people to volunteer as discussion leaders. That is, you are going to lead discussion uh, within a group. Okay, so I need five volunteers. Who wants to volunteer? Jack, you're in. Okay. Cool. You already raised your hand. Joey, awesome. Joey's in. Oh, Kaylin, she's in. Let's go. Okay, I need two more volunteers. Two more volunteers, and I'm going to start picking people. All right. Uh, oh, oh, wait, why am I... Sydney, I was, I was thinking Lynn's. I was like, I had last name. What's the first name? So Sydney's our fourth. We need one more. One more discussion leader. Me. Okay, Charles. Charles is going to be our fifth. Okay, now I need everybody, pick up your stuff, and I need you to find yourself a discussion leader. So discussion leaders separate out a little bit. Jack, sure. Jack's going to take the first row. I'm just going to sit here. Kaylin's going to take the second row. Joey, if you want to take the third row. Sydney, you can stay where you are. And then Charles. Um, Charles, if you want to hop to the back. Yeah, not, not, the way, not the way, way back. Just the fifth row. Okay, you want to make sure... You need to be close enough with the discussion leader. You got to be close enough with the discussion leader that you can actually talk to them. You don't need to like invade their personal space. There should not be any more discussion leaders. Here's some of your responsibilities. You should not have more than five people besides yourself in your discussion group. If you do, start kicking people out, right? It's time to be a leader. Kick people out. So there can't be five including yourself. Six including yourself, oh, five six. in addition okay. to yourself. Got it. Yeah. I can have one more. I got one spot. You've got, you've got 20 seconds. Got you got to figure this out. Come on, we're all adults here. Let's get it. Six per group. Six per group. I don't think... What, now, what would be fun is if we have more than 30 people in here, which, in which case it would be impossible to accomplish this task. You can sit wherever you want or stand. That works too. Okay, alrighty. So here's how this is gonna work. Other than what we what we typically do, um, it's not gonna be super different, except that now there's some there's a responsible party in charge, and you as a discussion leader, you need to make sure everybody's voice is heard. Everybody's voice is heard. As discussion leader, you're getting everybody in on the party, right? And then you as discussion leader, you are not able to actually communicate when we go to our corporate discussion. You pick somebody from your group to represent your group's position. All right? This is where it's fun because some of our discussion leaders are people that are always involved in our corporate discussions. And so now you get to help to get others uh, involved and, and work in and get everybody's voice heard. All right, let me pray for us and uh, we'll get started. Father, you are so incredibly good to us, so gracious and loving. And uh, Father, I know this morning I've just been reminded of how you provide things for me and for us and how you work things out to where the, what we experience develops us, makes us more like Christ. Father, I pray that that would be true today as we sit here in this discussion and as we think through these uh, materials Father, I pray that your spirit would move, and, and even through this, through a, a, a biology class, Father, that we would become more like Christ as we leave. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so before we finish up our discussion about mollusks, I'm going to put the group leaders to work a little bit, and I want you to think through this question, and as you think through it as a group leader, get everybody in your group involved, and, and this is what we're dealing with, okay? Okay. What is the value, what is the value in organizing animals into different phyla? What is the value there? Keeping in mind that we mentioned, really regardless of your view of origins, 
there are some animal phyla that, according to everybody's view of origins, do not actually represent an evolutionary trajectory, right? There are some phyla that are just there, even though they don't actually represent anything uh, that, that's, that's coherent. So what is the value? And this will be a short one. We'll just kind of work through this. Uh, what is the value of organizing animal according to phyla? You have 60 seconds as group leader to get everybody's voice heard. 60 seconds. Yeah, so I guess the album is going to row and it starts going down. Yeah. Five seconds. Yeah. Okay, my my perspective is to categorize and to see the similarities between um, different animals and stuff like that, and then to be able to effectively uh, look at those and then compare. All righty. Like Group in the back, led by Charles. What is the value in grouping animals according to phyla? <laughs> oh, the leaders taking leadership. Oh, I love it. Yeah, what, what's the, what, what is the value in organizing animals according to phyla or into separate phyla? What value does that provide or offer? What do we get out of it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of animals, right? Even if all you got out of it is you organize them in some way, right? If that's all you got out of it, that is a great, great thing, right? Just to get some order, because there are a lot of described animal species, almost 2 million described animal species uh, with estimates that there may be as many as 9 or 10 million living animal species. If all you got out of putting them according to phyla or into various phyla was it just it just sorted them. I mean that would be great. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, well, we kind of just said, well, we kind of Sure, while at the same time not having to consider everything, the whole diversity at any given time, right? So even if, even if all you got out of it was just to where you didn't have to think about the whole batch all at once, right? Every single feature that you find in animals all at once, right? So that's what you're getting at when you, when you put them into various categories. You do it based on something that's meaningful, right? And so even if it's more than just kind of just putting them into different categories just so it's more manageable, but actually taking a look at those categories and there's something meaningful there, right? There's shared features. And, and regardless of what that actually means, just being able to look at that and say, okay, we've got some shared features here. What do we do with this, yeah, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, regardless of what your view of origins is, there's some value there in, in sitting and thinking, okay, well, if all these organisms did root back to a single ancestor, what would that ancestor actually look like? And I realized I didn't put the homework for this week up until this morning. I didn't realize I didn't put it on until this morning this morning because I was putting it on, but I realized last night I didn't do it yet. 
And then I was like, oh, man, we got to have a homework for this week. And uh, so I, I went kind of that route. Like, if you were going to root all Deuterus stones back to a single ancestor, what would that ancestor look like? Actually, now playing this out, right? What would that ancestor actually look like? Joey, what do you got for us? You can't talk, though. Uh, Chad had an interesting thought. Yeah. Sure it, it could, at least for me, with my view of origins, go back to the Mayan Day uh, name everything. Sure. I feel like, in effect, getting extremely specific with your classification could be you are giving a name to every single animal. And yeah. That's, that's, a, uh, that's a part of, you know, the role humans have over the earth. Yeah, it's part of exercising that dominion. No, that's a great, that's a, that is a great uh, part of it, right? It's, it, and it, and it's not just, I, I think sometimes we have this sense that to exercise authority over something is, isn't somehow bad, right? That it's, I mean, it, it's almost like, man, that's, it's kind of uncomfortable to exercise your authority over something. But some, somebody has to be in charge, right? Somebody's got to be in charge. And the thing is, there's only one part, at least from what we can tell in Scripture, there's only one part of all of God's creation that has his image, right? And that's the part that's in charge, Right? And so part of that exercising that authority is doing just that, naming it, right? And in naming that, organizing them, yeah, it's, how, it's part of that exercising authority, which has a lot of value, okay? A lot of value. It actually helps you to carry out a mandate. Yeah. All right, what do we got? Kaylin. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe being able to forgive for other ones. Oh, I love that. That is so good. I was waiting for that. I'm going to give credit to you, Anna, even though you gave credit to Josh, because you were the one on the spot here. Although, Josh, it was a great thought. And I was waiting for that one to come out. There is, I mean, that's invaluable, right? To be able to look at a phylum, and if you know an organism is in there, to be able to predict what it's going to do, man, that, that is incredibly valuable. Right. If if you have a responsibility, let's just say hypothetically, you have a responsibility to care for something that doesn't belong to you, right? Like I don't know, maybe you are an image bearer of the Creator, and He made something. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Him, but you are responsible for its stewardship, right? You might be getting the sense this is this is not a hypothetical. This is reality, right? Uh, your ability to exercise stewardship over that is dependent upon, well, actually, several things. One, your obedience. Uh, two, your understanding, right? Your level of actually, uh, it, not even intellectual ability, but just your understanding of what's going on. And then three, your, your humility, realizing that, yes, you are exercising authority and you are stewarding, but ultimately the authority is not yours, it's God's, right? And so... The, but, but being able to, that middle one, your understanding is, is incredibly dependent on your ability to put things into manageable categories and to be able to make predictions based on where it is. That's huge, huge, right? So if it's like, if it's a mollusk, we left off on Friday. Wait, on Friday, was, is that right? Mm -hmm. Wait, what is today? Today's Monday, Monday right? Oh, no, no it wasn't on Friday, it was on Wednesday because I didn't actually, that's why I'm so confused. On, on Friday, I had Tim come and proctor your exam. He's a good man, by the way. Y'all should get to know Tim. But anyways, um, on Wednesday, we left off talking about mollusks, and we're like, man, mollusks is an incredibly varied phylum. Of, of all the animal phyla, it is probably the worst. I mean, it's probably the worst of all of the animal phyla. But there's still some value there because we're like, man, what characterizes a mollusk? And we're like, what has a muscular foot? Unless it doesn't right? It has a visceral mass, which you're like, well, that's cool. But all that means is like all of its organs are in the same place. And you're like, well, it's, it's true of, it's true of all animals, right? That have organs, like their organs are in the place where the organs go, which is in the coelom, right? That cavity. And you're like, well, that's not very helpful. And then it's like, well, they all have a mantle. And you're like, oh, well, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, they do all have a mantle. What's the mantle? It's just an outer covering. And you're like, wow. All animals have an outer covering. You're like, wow, this just really isn't that great of a phylum. And that's true, but there's still some value there, um, even though some of it is is kind of fake value. Yeah. All right. All right. Jack, yeah. what do you got for us? Noah's got this. Noah. Noah's got this. Um, 
<laughs> Pretty much you said most the same stuff that other people said. You okay. talked about uh, it making it easier to cross file on the yeah. and everything. Can you mention the stuff about ability? Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, no, this is good stuff. And so there are between, depending on classification scheme, 30 to 34 animal phyla, okay? And then depending on, like, particular views of origins, uh, all of those phyla may root back, like, all of the species in a phyla may root back to a single survival machine or not, right? Depending on whether your view of origins allows for that. And even within all views of origins, there are some animal phyla where it's like, oh yeah, like slam dunk. Foronida, for example. Look it up. I mean, I, I think it'd be, it, it, it's almost undoubtedly that all those organisms actually do root back to a single ancestor. But then you have a phylum like mollusca that really, there's just, arguably there's so little value to this phylum uh, that it's absurd to actually think that they all root back to a single ancestor, regardless of your view of origins. And so uh, many views of origins actually hold to that mollusks may actually not actually have a common ancestor. But if it did, it certainly wouldn't look like this. So this is one of our more derived groups of mollusks. What is this? Yeah. It's a snail, right? Who knew? You're going to have the answer to this question right off the bat, right? That it's just, it's just, wow, it's a snail. Sorry, I got really excited there. Um, but this is, I mean, snails are, are fairly simple animals at the organ system level, but still, this is an incredibly complex um, mollusks. So this, if, if all mollusks do root back to an ancestor, it, it, it probably wouldn't look like this. But snails are nice in that they actually demonstrate typical mollusk features, that is the muscular foot. It, it, it has it. Okay, it has the muscular foot that it uses for moving. This is a chitin in another group of mollusks called polyplacophorans. Uh, this, <laughs> bless you, if, um, if mollusks did root back to a single mollusk ancestor, it would probably look more like this uh, than it did like a snail, although this is still has some complexities, uh, almost completely sessile. These are organisms that even walking around the intertidal, you just, you just miss, you just miss, because they look like they're actually part of the rock. Uh, here's some more of the diversity of mollusks. Here's a, a type of bivalve mussels, and you know, um, yeah, I don't know how we actually attach this to organizing um, animals into phyla, but man, even though mollusca, it, it's not a real valuable phylum, man, there are some organisms in there that are delicious, right? <laughs> and so uh, mussels, a lot of bivalves, clams, scallops, I mean, they're just, they're, just good. they're just good, right? They just make things nice. Uh, even snails, squid, octopi. I mean, there's just something about it. So it's like, can we actually put it as a characteristic of mollusca? No, but I mean, there's just a lot of really good stuff happening inside of this phylum, culinary-wise. Um, so yeah, here's bivalves, and again, it, if if all mollusks do root back to a single ancestor, it would it would not it would not look like a bivalve. Uh, some more uh, uh, gastropods. Now these are really cool. I d d who knows what this is? What is this? It's a cone snail. This is undoubtedly the most toxic, poisonous animal on earth. I mean, just, I mean, and it's overkill. They eat fish. And it's like, yeah, they're snails, so they don't move really fast. So they need to like subdue their fish really quickly. But they have like 25 different neurotoxins in their venom. <laughs> One would do well, right? I mean, you can isolate these different neurotoxins apart and figure out, do you know how you measure the toxicity of venom? You do it by using what's called the LD50, which is basically how much of it is required to kill 50% of the mice you inject with it. So LD stands for lethal dose, and it's how much do you actually need to kill 50% of the mice that are infected with it. And what you find is each of these 25 neurotoxins is incredibly uh, toxic. I mean, just have a really low LD50, and you're like, man, this seems like overkill. And you've got this animal that, that I mean, just incredible. They make beautiful, ornate shells. I mean, just things that, you know, make your bookshelves or your mantle or your office really beautiful. And yet, as these organisms are living, I mean, they're just like killing machines. But yeah, I mean, I mean, they could take a fish from being super active, moving at high speed, to not moving just instantly, which is nice if you're a snail. I have two questions. So yeah. Are they both venomous and poisonous or just venomous? 
Um, I, I mean, so the, the, the distinguishing those is usually based on what happens if you consume it, right? If you consume it, uh, and it, and it has that, then we call it a poison. Uh, if you don't actually have to consume it, it has the same effects, you call it a toxin. Um, but I mean, distinguishing those for these organisms is, is, is unnecessary, I think. Although I've never tried to, to actually consume their, their venom. And then how do they infect the fish? Infect? Like with the... Yeah, yeah. So they have, um, yeah. So most mollusks have a feeding structure um, called the radula, uh, which is kind of interesting. It, it's, it's like a cross between a, a conveyor belt and a chainsaw. It tends to have like teeth on it because uh, a lot of the mollusks, they eat um, algae. And so they scrape algae off of rocks. And so they've got like these teeth and it is like a chainsaw, but also like a conveyor belt pulling whatever they're scraping off into the mouth. Um, and so a lot of snails have this. The cone snail, it's modified into basically a harpoon that's got a venom gland on it. And so they, they basically shoot this out and it's got a venom gland. Um, yeah, and so fish comes exploring, like fish wants to kind of eat algae off the shell or maybe even eat the snail, right? And then fish doesn't even know what's coming. You know? <laughs> yeah, but it's okay. The fish dies super quick, right? You don't have to worry about the fish. It dies super fast. It doesn't suffer. I guess there is one value of having 25 neurotoxins and having a venom that's a little bit overkill is whatever you eat dies really fast. It doesn't suffer. Yeah. So then would it be immune to its own um, venom if it's eating what it's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. All right. And then cephalopods, we mentioned this before, but cephalopods, I mean, besides primates, they are the most intelligent uh, animals on Earth. Did you, any of you watch a video of an octopus getting itself out of a jar? It's fantastic. I almost makes you want to go and get an octopus, right? You can go to some supermarkets and buy a live octopus and then just put it in a jar and watch it open the jar from the inside. Yeah. I saw a picture where they put, um, they had a squid and they put a bunch of different colors behind it to see which one it would turn into and it just turned clear. Yeah. Of it's just, I mean, just completely bypasses everything. It's fantastic. They don't see in color and yet they can basically become any color they want to become. Um, Although they probably don't really choose it. It just kind of happens. Yeah. So look at this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, can't cuttlefish as well, like, yeah. um, not only change color as well, but actually adapt their body. To yeah, change textures. textures yep. And yep. Stuff like so that can too. octopi. Yeah. yeah. So where it's like, if they want to look like coral, they can make themselves look and feel like coral. It's very interesting. So of all of the mollusks, of all of the mollusks, so you've got cephalopods like your squid, octopi, cuttlefish, all of those, and you've got gastropods, snails, slugs, uh, sea snails, and things like this. These are called scaphopods, and these are the most genetically similar to cephalopods. Right. What is that? <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's, it's so weird. It's so weird, and yet these are the most genetically similar. And so we're going to have some fun. We're going to come back to this example if you're like, what do we even do with that? When we come back to mechanisms of evolution in a few weeks, we're going to come back to this and talk about the relationship between genetic similarity and morphological similarity and how oftentimes they are related, but sometimes some really strange things happen. And it actually kind of pushes you in a direction like maybe you need some more data, right? <laughs> maybe you need some more data. All right. Is that all right? Mollusks? Okay. Let's talk about nematodes. Now, of all the animal phyla, nematodes are my favorite. Uh, why? I don't know. I mean, there's just, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about them, but, but I love these guys. And so nematodes are, are part of the polytomy and ectocyzoa. So I, I, I showed you before the phylogeny of animals and how we split protostomes into lophotrochozoans and into um, deuterostomes. Wait, no, into lophotrochozoans and ectocyzoans. And the textbook shows you the polytomy in Lophotrochozoa. It does not show you the polytomy in Ectocyzoa, but there is one. And it's just as difficult to deal with, just with less phyla. So nematodes are part of that polytomy. As uh, they are Ectocyzoan, something that they do have is they have to molt in order to grow. They've got to shed their outer covering uh, as they grow uh, throughout their lives. Now, this is the reason why I like nematodes so much. Many of them 
uh, are parasites of vertebrates. Over half of all described nematode species are parasites. And, and many parasitologists um, think that there's a, at least one nematode parasite for every animal species on Earth. And they're just waiting to be described. And so if you all want to go and you want to do a PhD in biology I, and you want to name something after yourself, mm -hmm. go into parasitology. The ability to actually name something either after yourself or better yet, name it after somebody you really dislike, right? Because you're naming a parasite, right? I mean, go into parasitology. So some of these examples, hookworms. Uh, these are two genera of hookworms, Ancelostoma and Nicator. Uh, man, these are terrible. These are, these are just terrible parasites. Usually, uh, I mean, we're really big, right? Some of us are bigger than others, obviously, but we're really big compared to uh, a parasite. You know, something that's like the size of a mouse, it's a lot closer to the size of its parasite than we are to ours. That makes sense? Okay. So usually it takes a whole lot of a parasite until you start to notice anything because we're just, we're so big, but not these guys. I mean, these guys, even small numbers can cause some really devastating things. They, they consume your blood. So they, they live in your intestines, they bite through the lining of your intestine and just drink your blood. And even in just a small number, they, they consume huge, huge amounts of your blood. So even in a small number, you can have a great deal of pathology. Uh, this genus Ascaris, this is a good example if you need, I mean, you just need tons in order to even know that you have anything going on. Uh, the estimates are one and a half billion people in the world are infected with this parasite. One and a half billion, and the estimates are about right around 100 million of the people in the United States are infected with this parasite. So you figure that's a little bit less than one in three. There are, I think, 31 of us in here, actually 33 of us in here. And so just statistically, you would expect 11 of us have this parasite. Don't even know it. Don't even know it. Even though the females of this parasite may be eight, nine inches long. You don't even know it. Don't even know it. Oh, man. Although if you do, if you want to find out, let me know, and I can, I can actually l let you know whether or not you're infected with this. Um, actually, what I'll do is tell you to where how you can figure it out yourself, and I'll let you do that. Uh, the last one that we'll talk about, filarial worms, uh, Wuchereria and Dirofilaria. These are really, really, really small uh, parasites, and they are transmitted by mosquitoes. And so both mosquitoes and vertebrates, including humans, are part of their life cycle. And so they transmit, they're transmitted from one host to another uh, through mosquitoes. Uh, this one right here, this genus is the causative agent of elephantiasis, which that name is absurd because it literally means infected by elephants. <laughs> uh, but what it does is it does turn your limbs into something that looks like an elephant limb. You get a lot of fluid building up, uh, and it, yeah, just completely distorts. Can you be infected with more than one of those? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they don't care. So, like, uh, Wuchereria or Wuchereria, these infect the lymphatic system, which is basically like the sewage system of your body. So, like, it, it makes sense that, that water has to leave the blood, right? So, like, water leaves the blood and goes into tissues as they use water up. That's why you keep drinking water, right? Because your tissues are using it. And so water leaves the blood, and then it's like, well, how does it get back in there? And it does it by going through the sewage system, kind of like, you know, when water leaves the sprinklers onto your grass, and then it gets back. Anyways, um, and so they live in the sewage system. And so basically they clog those ducts so that water can't drain back out of tissues. And so you get huge amounts of water building up in the tissues, and it just completely distorts the way those tissues work. Dyrofilaria, these are the heartworms that you treat like your dogs for. So if you ever wondered like, why do I treat my dog for parasites? It's so that kids don't get those parasites. Because a mosquito doesn't care whether it's a dog or a kid, it, it just wants a blood meal. And if it's got dyrofilaria, it'll give it to a kid. And then it's like, it's sad if a dog gets heartworms, but it's a lot more sad if a kid gets heartworms. Um, some other reasons why nematodes are important, they are pseudocelomates, right? We've talked about this before. What, what is a pseudocelum versus a eucelum? And so this is a gr great organism where you can actually see what are the implications 
of only having one side of that cavity lined. Because nobody cares if you kill these things. And so you can study them as much as you want. And so basically what you find is only having one side of that cavity lined, the circulatory system, very simple. Very simple, by necessity. You, you actually can't develop a complex nervous system. It also keeps muscles from forming around the gut. This is a problem, right? So if you can't actually form muscles around the gut, you have to move material through in a different way. We talked about this before, right? Maybe it was in my anatomy class where we talked about this. The only way to move material through, if you can't form muscles around the gut to keep material moving through, is you just have to keep packing in more material to keep stuff moving. And that's not good, right? Because then it builds up huge amounts of pressure in your gut. And it's okay. It works for a nematode. It would not work for us, okay? Not work for us at all. Be grateful that you are not a pseudocelomate. But these don't live really active, dynamic lifestyles, like you see lamates do. Uh, another wonderful thing about nematodes is they grow in very predictable ways. And so they make great model organisms, meaning things you can grow in a lab and you can study physiological stuff. Okay? I know it's a very technical term. I'm sorry. I try to avoid really difficult terms during our time together. Um, but yeah, just, just wonderful, wonderful organisms that you can study physiology, developmental biology, genetics, because you can grow them in the lab, you can predict how they're gonna grow, how they're going to develop, and nobody cares if you kill them. Nobody cares. Not even me, and I love nematodes. So one example of this, C. elegans. I don't know if you've heard this before, it stands for Cenorhabditis elegans. It is one of the most studied organisms on Earth. It is a nematode and it's microscopic, and it's, it's actually transparent, so you can see everything going on inside the body just by watching it under a microscope. It's just fantastic. Fantastic. And here's a picture of C. elegans, so beautiful. Oh no, this is not C. elegans. This is Heterodera glycinus. Oh, interesting. So this is actually a soybean uh, parasite. But anyways, uh, all nematodes basically look exactly the same. It's just, they all, yep, they're, they're, the common name for this phylum is roundworms. So they, are, they have a circular cross-section. Uh, and then here's the life cycle for another nematode parasite, Dracunculus metanensis, which has almost been completely eradicated from humans. But you, here you can see one actually being wound out of a human foot. And so the female may be 20, 25 inches long, and you can't just pull her out because then her body will tear and everything inside of her will be released into your body. Your immune system will freak out and you'll die. So you have to like slowly wind her out like a, a five millimeters, half a centimeter at a time per day. And it takes you months to actually wind this female worm out of your body. Fantastic. It's almost been eradicated from humans, but you can find them a lot. If you ever, you know, find yourself in the Midwest and you're like, you know what? I want to experience the Midwest like n very few people are, and you want to trap raccoons to skin them and sell to fur traders, like 20% of the raccoons you'll skin, they'll have these dracunculus worms in their ankles. And so you'll skin this raccoon, and then it'll just be left with like a six, seven-inch worm that's just sitting there. And you're like, what do I do with it? Don't eat it. <laughs> it's not worth it. Here, uh, here are C. elegans. Oh, man. These are, these are beautiful animals. All right. So we have a le another lecture break in this one. So team leaders, I'm going to put you to work again. Uh, how are annelids similar to arthropods? How are annelids similar to arthropods? We'll talk at the very end, how are they different? But first, how are they similar? Both are segmented. Okay, by segmented, it means you basically have repeated units. Okay, almost like a train. I mean, you should write, that's actually a great illustration. You should write that down, right? Like a train, you know, like train cars. You know what I'm saying? You've seen a train. Mm -hmm. oh, gosh, I got to tell you this story. It has nothing to do with this class. So, um, you, you all know we have, we have two foster kids, right? And like sometimes like this weekend, they're, they're, I mean, they're, 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 they're not outright defiant. It's just small things. And so it's, 
it's like it's like a game, right? Because they go and they they spend time with their parents and then they come back, and it's like they want to remind us that we're not their actual parents, right? But then like we have to remind them, yeah, that's true. But right now I'm the boss, you know. But anyways, so like uh, on Saturday, the three year old, the girl, she was being just she was kind of having one of those moments where it was just like kind of these small defiance. And uh, so like my wife stops the car before the train track and she sees the space in between us and the car in front of us. And she's like, pull forward, which I'm like, you're three years old. Why are you telling somebody how to drive? That doesn't make any sense. But anyways, my wife's like, no, like if we pull forward, then we're going to be on the train track. And if a train comes, we might get hit. She's like, that would be fun. <laughs> I want to get hit by a train. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> it, was just to, it was just to do like that, that like, I know that you don't want this to happen, so I want to get, and I'm like, really, you want to get hit? Do you know what would happen if you get hit by a train? She's like, no. And I was like, okay, well, let's just leave it at that. We'll make the decisions on how we drive the car, okay? <laughs> make decisions on, like, how you eat your snacks and, you know, drink your milk. Anyways. All right, so both are segmented, both are bilaterally symmetrical, both are UC Lamates. So you're like, okay, we'll both have those biomechanical necessities for an active lifestyle. Now, the segmentation in arthropods is actually masked. Uh, we'll talk more about this in a little bit by a process called tagmatization. So this is where you get a whole bunch of segments fusing together to form bigger structures, okay? The train illustration doesn't work anymore. Right, because that would require like fusing a bunch of cars of the train together to form a supercar or something. As far as I know, that doesn't happen, although it would be cool. Uh, both phyla have what are called CT, which these are like hairs that extend out through the cuticle. So you might be noticing that both also have a cuticle, right? I didn't say that, but if you're like, they both have hair that extends through the cuticle, the cuticle is a non living structure on the outside. So both have hairs. Now they use those hairs differently, but both have hairs. All right. Uh, both of them have complex nervous systems and complex excretory systems. <sighs> excretory systems, not, not for getting rid of feces, by the way. That's what the digestive system is for. Excretory systems for getting rid of metabolic waste, like urine and, and other <laughs> metabolic waste. Anyways. Um, now let's talk about how they're different. So annelids, uh, they have closed circulatory systems, whereas arthropods have open circulatory systems. Uh, and annelids are usually monoecious. Have we, have we talked about this term before? This is a good term. This term monoecious literally means one house. One house. And what it means is both male and female parts are in a single individual. Okay, so annelids have closed circulatory system, whereas arthropods usually have open, and annelids are usually monoecious or hermaphroditic, and arthropods are usually not. Is that what you, you were going to ask? Yeah. yeah. Although, like, when people are concerned, because there are some people that are hermaphrodites. Like yeah, but not like annelids are. Um, and and in, in humans, it's very, very rare where both systems actually function. Like, extremely rare. Like, one in every 10 million births. So, is it, but in this, so, like, in humans, it's usually, like, they have the organs of the opposite gender, but they don't... But they don't function, yep. Whereas this one, they both function Oh, yeah, yep, and they can self-fertilize. That's what I thought. Yep. A lot of annelids can actually self-fertilize. Now, they usually don't, uh, but they can. And then in an annelid, like, during reproduction, both individuals have their ova fertilized. So both individuals act as the male and the female during a reproductive event. So like when, when would they like, so they can occur to like, um, you know, reproduce with another annelid. But, yes. Um, but like when would they self-reproduce? If there's no other individuals present. So like yep. during times of like environmental uncertainty is when they would prefer to Yep. Like, yep. So now most of them can also reproduce asexually though as well. And so they'll usually do that if there are no other individuals present. They'll reproduce asexually. Well, how would that differ from self-fertilization? Because in self-fertilization, you can have an individual that's not genetically identical to yourself. Because in the process, when you go and make gametes, either you know sperm or ova, you're you're taking half of your total genome and packaging it into a cell, right? So if you do that twice, 
there's going to be some overlap. The chances of getting exactly half of your genes into one and exactly the other half that weren't in the other one into the other are very unlikely, right? There's going to be some overlap. And so if you self-fertilize versus asexual reproduction, you're producing offspring that are not genetically identical to yourself. They only have genes that you have, but they don't have all the same combinations, if that makes sense. Yeah. It'd be like equivalent to a deck of cards to where you basically have two full sets, you have two full decks in every cell, right? Right, well, so then when you go to make gametes, you get it down to a single deck of cards. But you may have like some repeats in that, right? And then so you have two different cells that each have a single deck of 52 cards, but the, as you bring them back together, they may have some repeats. Yeah. All right, so now team leaders, back to work. Okay, so here's the question. Uh, knowing that humans are also segmented, okay? So arthropods are segmented, annelids are segmented, humans are segmented. How do we explain the presence of this segmentation in these three phyla? How do we explain it? All right? You have more than a minute this time. This one's going to be a little bit more complex. You got to get every, everybody's voice gets heard. And this time, before we come to our corporate discussion, let the people decide whether or not they want to participate, right? Now, you may need to, like, urge them, right? That's part of being a leader, right? You may need to, like, talk them in to it, right? And say, oh, that's a great idea. You should share it with the group. Allow everybody to participate in what's going on inside your head, okay? But let them actually decide they want to do that before you just kind of call them out, all right? So take three minutes, 180 seconds, starting now. We'll go reverse this time. Oh, please not. Yeah. I have no. I don't know. No. All right. Russ. Well, because of, I mean, there, there does tend to be a relationship between how far you are away from the instructor okay. and your training. Wow. Oh, I get. Oh, I see where you're going with this now. So, yeah. So, biomechanically and stuff like that, it, things should like for them to function the way they do. They should be segmented. Uh, also, convergence as well. That's you know, basically that answer. But yeah. What do you guys have? So, how do we explain that? Yeah. 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 Well, first, yeah. What does segmentation accomplish? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. Like, you know, in maggots, you can see that segmentation. In B and ant larvae, you can see the segmentation. All right. What do you all think of this? Having a discussion leader, does it, do you feel like it's helped your engagement? Yes. Okay. I like it. I like it also because then it makes it to where I can tell the team leaders they can't actually talk. I mean, you can talk like during your team discussion, but you actually can't talk during our corporate discussion. All right, we're gonna go in the reverse order as we did last time. So group in the back, don't get too comfortable, okay? All right, Jack, did, you didn't come up with somebody that was gonna I, talk to I you. I asked and, and nobody responded to me. <laughs> it was kind of loud. Like, I guess, everybody comes I guess I can. All right. Um, Rachel, step in there. Okay, so the first thing I noticed was that um, not only is there the segmentation in common, but all the stuff at the top, too, being bilaterally symmetrical uh -huh, and uh -huh. ceiling mates. Um, so probably just that it's biomechanically necessary. Cause Ooh, I like that. that um, it helps more with the efficient movement. Yeah. And um, a more complex system. Okay, so she's, she's lobbying for that how do we explain segmentation in these three phyla, that segmentation is another biomechanical necessity. And you might be thinking, so what's an example of an annelid? No, of an annelid. An earthworm. <laughs> yeah, well, well, dogs are also, yeah, do, dogs, do, uh, dogs are actually also segmented. And so dogs, you can put humans and really any member of our phylum, which is chordata, will get there. They're all segmented as well. But yeah, annelids is an earthworm, right? And you're like, biomechanical necessity. We talked about bilateral symmetry for coordinated dynamic movement. And you're like, an earthworm, yeah, it's coordinated, but I wouldn't really call it dynamic, right? It's like, although it does actually require a great deal of energy to burrow down into the soil. And you're like, whoa. Anyways. Um, <laughs> And then, like, biomechan like segmentation, you're like, wow, they're not really super active. You know, it's not like this earthworm is, like, getting up and just, you know, destroying life as it marches around, you know, the ecosystem. But segmentation does make these organisms incre incredibly efficient. So earthworms, a single earthworm moves an enormous amount of soil through its body in any given day. And you might be thinking, well, wow, super duper like <laughs> why do we even care and the thing is is like you may not care until you think about that without the earthworms doing that and recycling those nutrients plants don't access nutrients as easily as they can and if plants can't access nutrients as easily as they can with annelids then the plants don't grow as quickly they don't grow as dynamically the animals you depend on that eat plants right the animals you like to eat like cattle that graze and you're like, without that grass growing as efficiently as it does with annelids. So annelids, in a, in a typical acre of land, let's talk about like a typical acre. I, 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 well, I'll, I'll get up there. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't want you to have to keep, keep holding your hand up. Um, and so in a typical acre of ranch land, let's say in a typical acre where maybe, let's just take the acre where you've got like all the feed. Right? So the cattle really like to hang out there. And you may have, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 head of cattle on that acre. The amount of earthworms in the soil, their total biomass would be 100 times what the biomass of those cattle are. I mean, it's just, just the sheer number of annelids in the soil. I mean, it's just crazy. There are a ton of them all doing what they do best and moving an enormous amount of soil, just moving nutrients, working on moving organic material around. Yeah, Sadie. Um, is the idea of biomechanical necessity, does that also coincide with um, the concept of convergence? So you could explain convergence that way, right? That it's a biomechanical necessity and that's why that pattern keeps showing up in separate groups right, that you get this separate feature that's not from shared ancestry. Yeah, you could explain convergence through biomechanical necessity. And in your original thing, you were thinking that that would be a better argument with the segmentation between the three phyla versus... Shared ancestry? Yeah, so I will tell you this. Uh, because of this segmentation, the understanding up until maybe 80 years ago was that uh, annelids, arthropods, and chordates, our phylum, all shared a more recent ancestor than they did with any other animals. 
And so the idea was that our most s similar animal ancestors were kind of shared between this. But what you find out is that annelids are lophotrochozoans, uh, arthropods are ectocozoans, and we're deuterostomes. So if you're going to go back to the ancestor of these three phyla, like if they actually do all root back to a single survival machine, you got to go all the way back to your original bilaterally symmetrical animal. And that's assuming that bilateral symmetry is homologous and not convergent, right? So you'd have to go back a really long time to get to the common ancestors of these three groups. And then now you have to explain, well, why are, do we have all these phyla that aren't segmented, right? still inside of that group as well. And so that's kind of been abandoned. I don't think anybody thinks segmentation is homologous. Um, it, your, your two best explanations are, it, well, actually, you're really your only explanation is, is, is it's convergent, and then you could come up with different reasons why that convergence exists. Are you looking at specific patterns of design, or are you looking at something that was such a bi biomechanical necessity that it just had to develop several times in several different lineages? Um, it depends. Uh, I, I, I think I, I'll say this. The more information we get, the more interesting the discussion becomes. Um, but the, the whole reality is, is oftentimes the issue isn't what are the data saying? The issue is does your worldview allow for that explanation, right? That's, that's oftentimes the bigger issue. Um, so if you can actually get into a conversation with somebody where they'll allow themselves to interpret the data... Right. And they'll, they'll interpret it honestly. And then you say, OK, well, what what do these data? What are they indicating? And, and then you, you, you almost always have to come with, OK, well, it's indicating that there's a distinction. There's a separation, that there's not a clear way of connecting these two groups. And then you're like, OK, well, what does that suggest? And, and it suggests separate ancestry. Uh, but then there's a question was, does your worldview actually allow for that? Because if your worldview doesn't allow for that, it doesn't matter that that's the best explanation. Right. It's just your worldview doesn't allow for that. So. Uh, I think we have a better explanation for convergent features than what you get through universal common descent. Because the, the only, like, all you have is biomechanical necessity, right? That's your only way to explain convergence uh, from, a, from a naturalistic perspective, where, you know, the diversity of life has just come about through small gradual changes. Your only explanation for it is biomechanical necessity. But then you're like, well, here we have a really active organism that actually doesn't have this feature. Now you've got kind of some interesting dilemma. Although if biomechanical necessity is just one of your arguments for why you have these patterns of design, then I think you have a better explanation for convergence. So I think we have a better explanation for convergence. Um, it's just a matter of whether that explanation works in, in, like, in your worldview. All right, so here's an annelid. Just beautiful, right? Beautiful, dynamic. Uh, even courageous animal, like going down into, into burrows that nobody would ever want to go down in. It doesn't care at all, right? Have I mentioned Survivor with you before? I like that show. I like Survivor. I was watching an episode of Survivor yesterday. This girl found an earthworm in the soil. No thought, just threw it right in her mouth. And it's like, man, if you're going to do that, just swallow it whole. But nope, she chewed it. She's like, you know what? I'm going to experience this fully. <laughs> And her face, her face said it all. It was not an enjoyable experience. But, man, she needed protein. And so she got herself some protein. But, I mean, just chop that thing up and, you know, throw it and swallow it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, some of these illustrations. We have one more framing question we still need to get to, but uh, we're out of time. But I feel like it was worth it to have our discussion. So enjoy the rest of your Monday. Uh, be safe. Make good decisions. Thank you.